record. Okay, so let's go into the actual presentation. So we're dealing with Qumran ritual tonight, another interesting topic here. So one of the things they found among the scrolls is scrolls that seem to be meant to be put into tefillin. They found 20 scrolls somewhere in tefillin type of cases. Wow. And these are the oldest surviving tefillin. So this is pretty neat, this finding. Okay, now, by the way, if you're wondering what I really wearing to fill in beforehand, we'll talk about that, even though the Talmud, which is uh, obviously a later work, talks about even uh, Michal, King uh, Shaul, King Saul's daughter, wearing to fill in. Uh, the fact that a reference is a woman wearing to fill in is another interesting issue. Uh, but at least the Talmud is, the Talmud is uh, theologically correct, saying even in a much earlier era, of course, they were wearing tefillin, which would make sense. God commands uh, B'nai Israel when they're in the desert regarding tefillin. Okay, so uh, in Greek, they're always called phylacteries, which means an amulet or a, perhaps a detective, uh, protective device. Uh, as we see in Matthew, uh, it looks at it that way. But in Judaism, at least the correct understanding of tefillin, it was never something that was supposed to protect you. In Jewish folk tradition, that certainly has uh, certainly has become the way tefillin is viewed. But that's not the. It's this is one of my hobby horses, actually. That kind of when I hear someone talking about the tefillin as some sort of protective device that's going to keep away evil from you or keep you out of trouble, it, it annoys me. So, like someone I remember saying they were in a, a car accident, and uh, they said, "I'm going to go check my tefillin." I felt like saying, go check your brakes. How about that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that it's the, the same sort of thing with the mezuzah. Yes, people treat it like a good luck charm. To yes, the yes, yes. So that's, uh, and he may have actually, I think, I think the quote was actually, I'm going to check my mezuzah. But, but it's the same, but it's the same, it's the same type of idea, even more so with the mezuzah. I remember we brought, uh, we bought our kids this cute little CD of Jewish songs. And one of them had to, it was a song about the mezuzah. It, it was based on that song, Oh No, We Have No Bananas. But instead it's, Oh No, We Have No Mezuzah, which oh, is a cute song. Yeah. But then it said the, the mezuzah is little thing on the, on the wall, which, uh, which protects us, which, which, is, which, which is not true. So we'll, uh, mm -hmm. we'll talk, we're going to actually talk about the mezuzah in context of Qumran. So we'll get back to that in a minute. But, uh, but the Hebrew, the word tefillin has the same shorish, the same root as Tefillah, so a prayer accoutrement maybe is a better English English translation. I know that's a mouthful. It's not a phylactery is also a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it's probably a better way of really describing what they are is something that's supposed to accompany you while you're diving. A, a, a tefillin or animus, for that matter, are considered are considered an oath. They're considered a sign. Particularly, tefillin is considered a sign of the covenant between God and Israel, the three specific ones, tefillin, Shabbat, and uh, Brit Milah, or bris. And by the way, the reason you don't put tefillin on, on Shabbat is because that Shabbat is, is its own sign of the covenant between God and Israel. So therefore, you don't infringe on Shabbat by wearing tefillin. Since you wear tefillin, maybe we could call them prayer accessories. Prayer accessories. Okay, that that's good too. I, I like that a prayer accessory. It's like the mask has now become an accessory too. All, all, all of the all of all of the all of these type of things. So uh, yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it, Irene. Okay, okay. Uh, and the, the commands originally appear in Exodus and Leviticus. They appear in the Torah. It's no surprise there. Now here is a surprise actually. Uh, it's assumed that the Sadducees understood metaphorically the concept of tefillin and didn't actually wear tefillin. The Karaites didn't wear tefillin. And this really, this really threw me for a loop when I thought about it. I, sa I said, wait a minute. The Sadducees and the Karaites are the literalists here. So if anything, you'd, you'd expect them to have them on literally. Uh, but uh, I think the problem for it was the Torah never really spells out what they're supposed to be, what, what really... Uh, they're supposed to look like in the text of a Torah. A Torah simply talks about them without really giving much detail. It tells them you're supposed to, the one on the, uh, it says you have your, your, your arm and your head, and the one on the head is actually supposed to be between the eyes, 
but uh, the Talmud, this is the rabbinic tradition, which is obviously the, the opposite of uh, the Sadducees and the Karaites, says that's not what it literally means. It doesn't mean you're not going to put the, the box on the box to buy it on your head, literally between your eyes. First of all, you wouldn't be able to see your sitter probably, and it would be really annoying. It means if you go up to your forehead area uh, and kind of went drew, drew lines up from your eyes up to your forehead, that, that's the spot your tefillin should be. It should be kind of in the center of your head, right, right uh, behind where your hairline is or was, depending on your situation. It shouldn't be all the way to one side or the other side. So, but I, I, yes, Alan. Uh, as, as you're making this point about the Sadducees and the Karaites not wearing tefillin, uh, to follow Irene's comment, uh, they they still had uh, mezuzot on the door on the at the doorways, right? As far as as far as I know, I, I would I would I would I would strongly assume the answer is yes. But uh, in preparation, uh, in preparation, I didn't say anything specific about the mezuzah. Okay. Uh, but it does make this point to, about the Sadducees and the Karaites regarding tefillin. Uh, and we certainly see that the Qumran sect took uh, an approach that was at least similar to the Pharisees in, in the fact that they were finding uh, scrolls of tefillin and some even boxed like in right. tefillin you could actively use. Okay, so uh, the rabbinic tradition, by, by the way, argues over, in other words, the machlok, the rabbinic argument, surprise, surprise, rabbis arguing. So mm -hmm. it argues over the order of the uh, four passages that make up uh, the, the parchment and the actual tefillin, two of them from Exodus, two of them are from Devarim. So uh, there's a, well, oh, I'm blanking out here, it was, uh, I think it was Rashi, Rabbeinu, Tom, and how am I blanking out on this? I used to know this. Uh, the Rabbeinu Tom Tefillin is the other, I, I assume the other is Rashi Tefillin. Does that sound right to everyone? No one knows what I'm talking about? I remember some, I remember that there were two. I do not remember the details. Yeah, I, I, I think it's Rashi and Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu Tom, but uh, Rabbeinu Tom being of the Tosafistic school, which argued with Rashi. But the the point of, the point of the matter is, is two different, uh, two different, uh, <laughs> even amongst the, um, the Rishonim, which are later than the Talmudic period, we're talking about Rashi, the time of crusade, Crusades, and Rabbeinu Tam, who's his grandson. There's arguments over how the passages are supposed to of tefillin are supposed to be structured, and the, there are some people that will put put on uh, tefillin twice in a day. Even now, one time we were, I was at a rabbinic conference. It was time to daven mincha, so one of the rabbis said, "I'm going to put on tefillin again." And uh, he said, one is uh, what, uh, my Rashi tefillin, the other is my Rabbeinu Tom uh, tefillin. So he wanted to make sure he was hitting both opinions. Really? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, a it's a little much for me, but uh, whatever floats your boat, shall we say. Okay. Uh, okay, so the Qumran had a different order, by the way. So it gives you not only the two, uh, the, the two Talmudic or later on opinions of the uh, Rishonim, but we have the Qumran order as well. Not particularly surprising. Okay, so now we're going to the now we're going to the mezuzah here. So the mezuzah. Oh, Rabbi, um, I, I just looked it up. You're right. It is Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam. Okay, yeah. It's like one of these things when I was in my mind, I'm, I like said I know it, and as it was coming out of my mouth, I was like, is this really right? <laughs> so, but thank you, Irene. Thanks for uh, thanks for. I feel better now clarifying that. Thank you. So we have the mezuzah now from uh, is from passages from Devarim from Deuteronomy, as we have on the scroll again. So originally the mezuzah is based really on the the Corban Pesach, but putting the blood of the Paschal offering on the door on the doorpost. And part of the misunderstanding about the mezuzah is people think that. People think that uh, B'nai Israel would put the blood on the doorpost so God would know who to strike and who not to strike when he carried out Makot Bechorot, the 10th plague. So if you actually read, read the passage carefully, it's a, it says the, the, the dam, the blood is an ot lechem. It's a sign for you, for the people of Israel. Uh, so what they're really doing by uh, they're sacrificing the Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering, I'm putting the blood on their doorpost. It's, God doesn't need to tell them who's an Israelite and who's an Egyptian. He can figure that out. 
what he really what, what it's really doing is the people are making themselves worthy of salvation by performing this mitzvah and in a sense proudly identifying as uh, it's like uh, later on maybe putting a menorah in your window something like that they're identifying as people who are ready to be redeemed so it's not really protective as it's uh, it shows that you're ready to be redeemed and then later on with in uh, in Parshat Mishpatim and later on in Exodus it makes it makes the point in a like the reverse type of fashion where it tells you you're supposed to want to be free this is the reference to the uh, slave who doesn't want to be freed on the advent of his Shemitah year uh, on a sabbatical year when he's supposed to be freed by his master he says basically being a slave is not so bad I uh, I have a I have a bed a roof uh, I get my meals I have cable TV if I'm lucky whatever it is you get the point so he he wants to stay a slave so they bring him to the uh the doorpost uh, of the bet in of the court and they basically put an all through his uh ear at the doorpost and the point was really you're saying his ear didn't hear of a message of the mezuzah the message of the mezuzah is you shouldn't want to be you shouldn't want to serve a human master god has freed you to serve god to even in a more egalitarian sense be partners with god so uh, so even though we allow for slavery in ancient Israel, even a, it's a limited form, really more probably indentured servitude, it's not the ideal condition. So that's really, so the mezuzah really supposed to remind you, hey, we, God has freed us and we're supposed to be God's servants and partners. And when we're God's servant, it's much more elevated than being a servant to a human being. So it's a rejection of sla uh, slavery. That's really the message of the mezuzah. It's not supposed to protect you from the boogeyman or that type of thing, they're already we're going into magic, which is the opposite of religion. If you think about it in a very simple sense, magic is really an attempt to control the world, to control divinity through supernatural methods. Religion takes the opposite approach, basically. It, it uh, demonstrates a certain amount of humility, saying there are certain things which are, about, which are beyond human control. We simply can't control on our own. Okay. So, uh, interestingly enough, different sectarian groups here during this time period, and remember, sectarian groups were very common, and when we say sectarians, we think of perhaps groups that are small, sinister, even not mainstream. They probably weren't thinking of themselves in those terms. This is later on, as the uh, Pharisees and uh, the Rabbinites, as they're called, really win the day. Later on, the other groups, uh, looking back, become like sectarians, these little uh, pesky type of groups almost. But some of them in other mezuzot included the uh, Ten Commandments, and the Qumran mezuzah actually included the Ten Commandments. Now, the rabbis always had a uh, problem with the Ten Commandments. Uh, interesting, we're talking about this right after Shavuot. Anyone know what the rabbinic issue of the Ten Commandments was? I think they were, um, the rabbis were concerned that the people would think that the Ten Commandments uh, were the only laws that we had to follow and, and that, you know, all the rest of the stuff didn't count. Yeah, it, that, that's exactly that's exactly the concern is the Ten Commandments were, had such a special place in the Jewish mind. The concern was basically forget about these over 613 commandments or what I mean, I realized the idea of Tari Agmet, so 613 commandments may be somewhat fluid during this time period, but I, Irene's exactly correct, is there was a concern that the people would say, oh, th these, ten are the, these 10 are really the, the, the commandments, the rest are right, they're not so important. So they actually, originally the 10 commandments were in the end of the Shachrit service. And if you look in a most Sidarim, you'll actually see after the formal service is over, it has the 10 commandments. So if you privately want to recite them, it's like extra credit. It's a good thing to do. It, it's Torah study. It's good. But the rabbis actually took it out of the Shacharit service to show that, to, to um, de-emphasize their importance at the expense of everything else. So it's not really surprising that in, uh, in our mezuzah, which is from the Pharisee rabbinic tradition, we don't have the Ten Commandments. When you see it in an earlier stage, it was quite trendish among uh, at least certain groups to have uh, have the Ten Commandments in your uh, in your mezuzah. We have the uh, I, I had a question about whether the idea of the Ten Commandments was 
in one sense, uh, there is a story, I think it was a story related to Jesus and some prophet or uh, rabbi who was saying, well, tell us what the whole Bible says on while you're standing on one foot, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And that is basically everything you need to know and all the rest you'll pick up on. Well, I wonder if the idea of the Ten Commandments isn't just a similar kind of shortcut. The idea that you, you take everything and you look at the kind of the shortcut uh, or, I don't know, uh, cliff notes, if you will, of, of the whole idea. Do you think it's the same idea? Rather? Well, I, yeah, so uh, I, I think the answer is yes. For, you're referring to the story in the Talmud, it's in Shabbat with Hillel and the Roman for it's actually there's three different inc incidents uh the one you cited is the most famous but right. you have these three people who are interested to in converting Judaism and they approach Shammai who's uh Hillel's intellectual adversary right. it doesn't exactly. mean they, they 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 according to rabbinic tradition the uh, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai they got along and they were respectful <laughs> Their, their sons married their daughters, vice versa, but they, they had different points of view. And Shammai is a much more author, authoritarian figure. Hillel is the uh, gentler one. So you have these three converts, basically, who make these outlandish requests. One of the requests, by the way, is make me the high, if you make me the high priest, I'll convert to Judaism. So Shammai has some sort of stick in his hand that basically whacks the guy and says, uh get get lost you clown you're wasting my time so the guy goes the guy goes to hillel this uh, roman goes to hillel and hillel says sure let's learn a little torah first so they start learning some torah and the guy says the guy reads and says wait a minute even if a even if someone who is born a jew uh goes into the holy of holies he could be he could be stricken dead I'm going to convert to Judaism and suddenly I want to be performing uh, rituals in the temple. I'm a goner if I do that. So uh, I, I, I withdraw my request to become the Kohen Haggadol, but I still want to become Jewish. That's one. The other, the next story is a guy comes up to first Shammai and says, uh, teach me uh I forget it. Well, the whole it I thought it was the whole Bible while standing on one. Well, foot. that's that's the third case. That's oh, the third okay. case. The, the next one is the guy wants to. Uh, he oh, the next one is the guy wants to be converted to Judaism, without accepting the uh, Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law, which we've been talking about a lot. So again, Shammai says, "Get lost, clown." Hillel says, "No problem. Let me teach you how to read Hebrew first. So one day Hebrew, Hillel teaches in the Aleph Bet starting with Aleph. The next day he teaches in the Aleph Bet starting with Tuf, the last letter. And the guy says, wait a minute, I don't get it. Which way does the Aleph Bet, by the way, the word alphabet comes from Aleph Bet. Uh, but where does, uh, which way does it start? The Aleph or Tuf? And Hillel said, look, you're reliant on me to even teach you the alphabet. Certainly you're going to need someone to explain Torah to you. In other words, oral teachings to accompany this terse text. So he's impressed. He converts to Judaism. The third story is the guy who says, teach me the Torah while I stand al regal ahat, on one foot. So Shammai again says, you're wasting my time. Leave me alone. He goes up to Hillel and Hillel says to, get, Hillel says to the guy, uh, no problem. So, uh, and he says, uh, what, what is hateful to you? Don't do unto your fellow, which is uh, kamoha. Uh, love your neighbor like yourself in the negative form. The guy is impressed that Hillel, while on one foot, could teach him the uh, can teach him the whole Torah, or at least Hillel basically Hillel says this is the essence of the Torah. The rest of the Torah is commentary on how to fulfill this one mitzvah. Right. The guy is impressed. He converts to Judaism. Yeah. So similarly, Susan, uh, what's happening? I think with the Ten Commandments, and I've I've made this point. I've made this point before, and. The sages and Mafarshim have made this point in slightly different ways than I make it, but it's really the same point. It is what you have in the Ten Commandments is you have these general principles. They're very lofty and somewhat vague. And uh, in other places in the Torah, it really fills in more of the details on how specifically you're supposed to observe these commandments. Uh, that's the way Rashi views, for instance, uh, Parshat Mishpatim, which follows the giving of the Ten Commandments. Is he saying now you're really getting the, the nitty gritty 
of of how to be a uh, how to be an observant Jew. Basically, you're you're getting uh, how how to treat people well, uh, tort tort law, all of these things. You really need to observe the Ten Commandments well. You think about it. You think about also Ten Commandments is an easy one. The command to observe Shabbat. Well, yeah, Zachor Shabbat, uh, Shamor Shabbat, remember Shabbat, observe, uh, observe Shabbat. What does that really mean? Uh, that in itself uh, is maddeningly vague. So you, in other places in the Torah, it fills in those details. So I think your point is uh, spot on. Okay. So what I, I want to say, we have this Nash papyrus, which is found in Egypt, 125 before the Common Era. I wonder if this is the Elephantine community, which was a Jewish garrison in Egypt when, uh, when the kingdom of Judah, uh, Judah was in league with the Egyptians for a period of time. They were in league with the Egyptians, out of league with the Egyptians uh, during the first temple period, uh, even though 120, 125, obviously, uh, the first temple had long since been destroyed. Okay, but regardless, 125, we have in Egypt, this Nash Papara, uh, which has on it in the uh, mezuzah parchment has the Ten Commandments and the Shema on the scroll. So it has two of the most famous texts from the Torah right on the scrolls. The Samaritans, by the way, we discussed them before. These were people who were moved in during the uh, first temple period. This, this refers to a time period when there was divided monarchical era and the, uh, the northern 12, 10 tribes were being exiled by the Assyrians after a failed revolt, about 722, 721 before the common era. So what they did is they took Israelites out of the north of the Shomron area and they brought in people from other parts of the Assyrian empire. And this was a way of really ethnic cleansing, breaking down identities in a sense so people would no longer revolt against them. If you don't have a strong identity as a member of the your Ephraim or the 10 tribes of Israel, they're called, you're less likely to revolt. So they, they put you somewhere else and you kind of assimilate into another part of the empire. But they moved in these other people and these other people, these Samaritans from, the, from Shamron, learned certain Jewish practices. We're told even they, <laughs> they were being attacked by lions. And as they were attacked by lions, they said, well, maybe it's because the God of this land, in other words, the God of Israel, wants us to worship him too. So they worship, so they learned some Jewish practices, but they kept some of their practices from wherever else they were brought in from. And uh, eventually when the Jews come back during the early second, uh, when they're ready to build the second temple, when Koresh or Cyrus uh, lets them go back, we're talking about now 539, 538 to about 520 or so, the... Uh, this is the Jews go back under uh, Zerubbabel and those type of figures, those type of leaders. And the Samaritans who are still living there, by the way, say, uh, let us rebuild the temple. We're Jewish, too. And uh, the Jewish authorities say, well, you have some Jewish practices, but you're not Jewish. Sorry. And there's always tension between the Samaritans and the Jews as well. Uh, the Samaritans felt rejected. Obviously, they didn't like that. So uh, they and there's, there's still a small, small group of Samaritans today, and uh, they have they have not a mezuzah like we have but, uh, on the doorpost, but they have really more of a plaque above the doorway, which includes the Ten Commandments. So uh, it's fascinating. Okay, they, have, they have their own temple in uh, Mount Gerizim too, don't Har, they? Har, Har, Har Grizim. So right, I believe they still sacrifice there. Actually, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, the in, in, interesting, interesting people. So uh, the Qumran text, uh, Qumran text. So certain scrolls. This is interesting, and we're going to have really see how this uh, affects us today. Even so, uh, some of these scrolls talk about blessings over food before and after eating, which we have. Which we have. We have the berakat, uh, uh, a berakat hamazon after eating. Uh, which the rabbis say is derived from the Torah, which tells us to eat, to satiate, and be blessed. And the rabbis, uh, so that's a, a biblical command, is to uh, say, Be'erkat HaMazon. But the rabbis also institute a rabbinic decree that you're supposed to make a blessing before you eat. And they use an asmachta, which is uh, a support from, uh, support from Tehillim, from Psalms. 
you can't make a, a law based on Psalms. You'll only make laws based on uh, verses from the five books of Moshe, the five books of Moses, Hamisha, Chum, Torah. But you could use uh, the rabbis in order to support a rabbinic decree. You can use a, uh, a text from the uh, Navim or Ketuvim, the prophets and the writings. So we sing in, in Hallel, Hashemayim, Hashemayim, Lahashem, Vaharat, Natan, Levnei Adam. That's the heavens. The heavens are God's, but the world below, He's given to man. So the rabbis say, well, God gave it to us, but you're not going to take something he gave to you without at least saying thank you. So you make a bracha before you're eating as well. So they had vows and Qumran as well. And the priests would lead blessings. This was a very uh, priest-centered society. As we discussed, it was really, it seems to be at least founded by priests, which puts it in opposition to, uh, to the Pharisees, which are uh, more empowering lay people in the form of lay people who become rabbis. And when I say lay people, they're rabbis as opposed to priests. That's what I mean by lay people, even though they're rabbis. Okay, so the text of the scrolls seem to foreshadow the rabbinic idea that, uh, that to eat its fruit and of its goodness. In other words, we have this, uh, the rabbis, as we mentioned, come up with this idea that you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you're supposed to bless because of the goodness. And even we see this in Berakat Hamazon. Uh, talking about all about the good. So this idea of blessing before and after your eating is bound to this idea of giving thanks to God for his good, for his goodness. So even though it, even though we think about these as uh, Mishnaic and uh, ideas, ideas that then appear again in the Gemara and discussed, they actually seem to be really earlier and only later on get canonized in the Talmud later on. So this is interesting here. Deuteronomy 8.8 8 refers to grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. Now, these are, these are, these are, uh, would require a special uh, short bear cut Hamazon after eating uh, Kazai and Owlsworth of them. You wouldn't, you don't say the full bear cut Hamazon, that you only say after bread, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you make a bracha achrona, it's called. Al ha'etz v'al pri ha'etz. So if you eat one of the if you eat one of these, the after bracha you make is uh, is this bracha achrona. And uh, if if you eat, let's say, different fruit like an apple, there's a different uh, after a shorter, even a shorter after blessing than this short after blessing. But verse nine explicitly mentions in Deuteronomy explicitly mentions the bread. So, and then verse 10 says, you should eat, you should be sated, and you shall bless, uh, bless God for the goodness of the land that he gives you. So based, so based on verse 10, that's the idea of the full Birkat Hamazon. Uh, but first, uh, verse 9, uh, excuse me, verse eight, verse 8 really lays out the, uh, the argument made for a bracha or the foundation for this shorter after blessing. Okay. So, so, and and we see later on this idea is picked up in the Talmud: a full bear cut hamazon only after eating bread. And people, by the way, argue over pizza: is pizza eating is pizza bread, or is it more of a mazono? Is a mazono more of a uh, what's the word I'm blanking on? What's the word I'm blanking? a grain? Is it really more of a grain? And some say yes, some say no. Some say it's a matter of kavana. In other words, uh, Moshe Feinstein says if you have. Uh, if you're having two pizza, uh, two pieces of pizza, that's like a meal. So you wash, do natila yadaya, make a mozi. Uh, if you're having one piece of pizza, it's more like a snack food. So therefore, you'd uh, make mizono and then make the brach, uh, bracha achrona, uh, bracha achrona, excuse me, al chamichya. But the, the more important point is these ideas are from, these ideas were already around. We see them in Qumran, and eventually they get canonized, at least a version of them get canonized into the Talmud and the rabbinic tradition. So by the way, in the, scr in the scroll, which uh, talks, which has verse eight and nine, the Qumran scroll from Devarim, there's a, a space between verse eight and nine. And uh, it suggested perhaps the sect was actually anticipating this rabbinic ruling. In other words, differentiating the eating of the uh, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives and dates versus eating bread. So maybe they put a space there. That, that's a theory, no one knows for sure, but it's certainly interesting. And later on, the Talmud does make that differ differentiation. Okay. So the importance of 
all of what we've discussed here. So it appears from the school, it appears from the scrolls that the practice practices delineated in the Mishnah were not practices invented in the time period of the Mishnah. Rather, they were earlier practices which are now being recorded, being written down, being uh, canonized in the Mishnah. So the Mishnah canonization, let's say 200 of the common era or so, and it was often argued before these are basically new practices invented uh, by these Jewish radicals who were trying to give them authority by claiming they were really much older and biblical in nature. And the fact that they're now being found in these scrolls, which date to a, a somewhat earlier time, seem to indicate that no, these were not totally made up by the people of uh, people, uh, rabbis of the uh, latter Mishnaic period, second century. They really do seem to be older traditions, which are now being perhaps tweaked, changed, arguing the best way to uh, perform these traditions or taking two different traditions, which are exi existing simultaneously and arguing, which is the best way to fulfill, uh, fulfill a certain mitzvah. But nevertheless, they seem to really have been around longer, which uh, from a, a continuity traditional point of view is very reassuring in the sense that this is not something that people just made up uh, during a certain time period. It seems to really go back, as we say, halakhala, halakhala Moshe Misenai, a law from Mo, uh, it's a, it comes from Moses, from Moses on Sinai, has been passed on from generation to generation, and sure, in the rabbinic era, there's discussions on uh, how to perform the mitzvah best, what, what the Torah really means, but nevertheless, uh, they have their origin back uh, during the period of Sinai. In fact, there's a famous teaching about uh, Moshe. We're told Moshe Rabbeinu uh, is able to see a vision into the future during the time of Rabbi Akiva. And he's sitting in in this vision on the class. Rabbi Akiva is teaching his students. And Moshe Rabbeinu has no idea what he's talking about. The Rabbi Akiva is teaching Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't have any idea. And he gets very upset about this. I mean, he's Moshe Rabbeinu after all. He's the greatest uh, prophet, the greatest rabbi of all time. And he can't follow the, the shiur of a lesson. So, and then he hears Rabbi Akiva say, halachala Moshe mi Sinai. In other words, this, uh, this teaching really goes back from, to Moses at Sinai. In other words, so the original idea is from Moses at Sinai and it's evolved and we've uh, worked on it and those type of things. And we may uh, have had to, we may have to understand it in context of our time, just like all the time rabbis have to, take ideas and apply it to our time issues like as a Shabbos elevator and living wills and all this uh, medical technology have to be applied to our time. But nevertheless, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls seem to show that these things really do go back to an earlier period, which from a, a traditional view is quite reaffirming, actually. OK. Uh, and so, so at this point, unless the Mishnah speaks of something being invented later, you have to really assume it's earlier. And then we do know certain things, uh, Hanukkah and Purim, I think are the best examples of things, which we know are, are, are really uh, invented later, the, the two non-biblical holidays, which the rabbis come up with. But otherwise you really have to assume things are invented, uh, things go back earlier, or sometimes the rabbis are also uh, not inventing things, but putting, uh, making a, a fence around the Torah, uh, a gezera a fence around the Torah in order to protect the original Torah law. My favorite example, just because it's very easy to understand, is the issue of muksa, which you know, people say muksa, it's really pronounced muksa, but that's the issue of not touching things, are on, or not really, it's not really picking up or moving things on Shabbat, which uh, could lead you to accidentally use them in an inappropriate light, like a pen. The Torah, Torah law forbids you from writing on Shabbat, the rabbi say, don't pick up a pen, don't move a pen, because once it's in your hand, you might accidentally jot something down. So we're going to put a fence around that and say it is rabbinically forbidden to even pick up, uh, pick up or move a pen. I, I have a question about Purim. It, it seemed to me that in the Purim story uh, that it, it says that, although it's not part of Leviticus 23, but it says in the Purim story that, uh, that this is a, supposed to be a day that is celebrated uh, forever or whatever it says. I can't remember the exact wording. Is that, am I mistaken about that? So uh, that, that's, a, that's a way of saying going forward, this will now be a, right. a holiday. But so, that yeah, was so, before the, it was before the rabbinic era 
it was certainly like three or four or 500 BC. So it was before the rabbinic era that it was suggested in the, in the text that it, you would celebrate it as a holiday. Okay. Right? So, well, it's an interesting point. So there's two different points I want to make regarding that. So the story itself of uh, the Megillah and Mordechai and Esther is placed after the destruction of the first temple before the second temple is built. Right. So we're dealing from 586 before the Common Era to, let's say, 538 before the Common Era. So that's, that's historically where the story is placed. Right historians and scholars will say that the story was probably written down, shall we say. This is not a theolog theologically correct thing I'm saying. I'm giving you, speaking from an academic point of view. I've heard around 200 uh, common era, uh, I mean, 200 before the common era, somewhere along those lines. It was, it was, really, it was really written down. But the point is, that's not even really the important point. The point is that the rabbis are coming along. They're, they're, there's no pretense. They're not. They're not trying to say, Purim is commanded in the in the uh, Purim is commanded in the five books. It's not. What they're saying is, this is a this is a this is this is a holiday that's found in the Ketuvim, the last book of the Tanakh, not the original five books, and therefore it doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the weight of biblical authority. Only the holidays in the five books have biblical authority. And we as rabbis now are going to make rabbinic laws commanding you to observe Purim, reading of the Megillah, and, and all, and Matanat uh, Levyonim, Mishloach Manot, giving to, giving to the uh, poor and giving gifts of food to your friends, Purim Su'uda, Purim meal. But the rab, the, even, the, even though the according, even though according to tradition, the holiday clearly takes place at a much earlier time. The rabbis uh, are being very upfront here and saying this is purely a rabbinic decree, and it's a rabbinic decree because this book, even though it's in the Jewish biblical canon, is not in the first part. It's not in the five books, which is the first part. Good question, Susan. Very, very nice. All right. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay. So uh, I enjoyed the discussion as usual, everybody. And uh, we're on for next week again. We, this is a uh, we still have a few uh, we still have a, a, f a few left actually, and I am starting to think about the next one after this as well. Uh, any interest in Jewish intellectual thought? It's another one of these Ruderman lectures who we use for the first uh, class. <laughs>